So everyone, welcome to a virtual field trip with Little Ray's Reptiles. We are so lucky to be joined by the lovely Jasmine from Little Ray's today. Hi my guys. Is, hi Jasmine. Thank you so much for coming. So my name is Sam. I'm from the events team here at Algonquin College, and we've been putting on a bunch of virtual events throughout the pandemic. So this is a really awesome kind of new thing that we're doing, like virtual field trips, because we're all missing out on that kind of interaction. Oh my gosh, and I see some animals in the videos. That's so cool. We're so happy to have everyone here today. So I'm just going to give a little introduction and some housekeeping notes before we get started. All right, everyone. So... Like I said, we're having a bunch of different online events through our events team. So if you would like to tune into our virtual events like this one, you can find through you can find them through our events calendar, which we'll link in the chat. Today's event has closed captioning, which is available in English if you need it. And if you'd like to turn that on, you can press the closed captioning button that's labeled CC along the bottom of your toolbar. Um, following today's presentation, we are going to do a short Q&A, but if you would like to ask questions to, Lynn, to Jasmine throughout the presentation, feel free. Just make sure to keep yourself muted, raise your hand, and I will lower your hand and unmute you and you can ask, or you can type your question in the chat and I'll read it out loud to Jasmine to answer. But we will be doing a short Q&A at the end as well. All right, everyone. So to kick off today's event and to break the ice a little bit, we're going to give everyone a fun question to type into the chat. So the question of the day is, what is your favorite animal? So if you could type that in the chat and make sure you're typing to everyone so everyone can see it. So I think my favorite animal, this is so hard for me. I have so many. I love pigs. I love dogs. I love cats. I love dolphins. I love sharks. I basically love all animals. The only one that I'm kind of iffy about is snakes, but <laughs> I'm very, I'm very curious about them. It's not that I don't like them. I'm just kind of like a little scared of them, but I'm very curious about them. I love to learn about snakes. So let's see what everyone else is putting in the chat here. We've got a raccoon. Raccoons are super cute. Cats, owl, that's a really good one. Dogs, penguins. I love penguins. Cheetah. That's awesome, guys. Thank you for sharing. Dogs, turtles, sharks, wolf. That's awesome, everyone. Jasmine, do you have a favorite animal? Can you choose? That's a great question. So I don't have a favorite animal. It's really hard for me to pick just one. Yeah. But uh, I have, I'm right now I'm in the exhibit of one of my favorite animals at Little Ray. Well, yes. That'll be a great way to kick it off. Exactly. All right, guys. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of Little Ray's here. Um, so Paul Little Ray Goulet and his partner Sherry started Little Ray's Zoo in 2000 after years of caring for animals and providing educational presentations. They both had a huge passion to support education and conservation and Paul and Sherry Goulet have been inspiring folks of all ages for over 25 years so they've been in Ottawa for a long time with their zoo. Um, today, Little Ray's Ret Reptile Center is the largest animal rescue in Canada with one of the most extensive and diverse animal education and outreach programs in North America. It also boasts an award-winning live animal tra traveling museum exhibit program, which I'm sure a lot of you have experienced, the ones that they uh, bring all the animals to your school and show off the cool snakes and things like that. I love those as a kid. Those are my favorite thing. Um, Little Ray's Nature Center is about inspiring action through hands-on education. To this day, it's still operated by Paul and Sherry and their expert team of keepers and educators, just like Jasmine, with the same passion that centered it all. So you guys, I now have the pleasure of handing over the floor to Miss Jasmine here, who's going to take us through the zoo and show us some really cool animals. Take it away, Jasmine. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be doing this. Like I said, I'm in the exhibit of one of my favorite animals that we have here. And I will just turn around the camera so you guys can get good at a good view. So here we are. You might recognize these guys. They're quite popular, especially if you've seen the movie Madagascar. So these are ring-tailed lemurs. We have two of them in here. We named them King Julian and Queen Elizabeth. These guys are super curious. Love to look at the iPad whenever I come in here. Hi. Yeah, I'll turn around the camera so you can get a better view. 
There we go. Very curious, guys. They love shoes, love the iPad especially. So they are ring-tailed lemurs. Um, that's just, you can see on their tail there, they are uh, named after that. Oh, sorry, he's just grabbing the iPad of my hand. Let me, can you guys still see it okay? Yeah, we can still see it, it looks okay. awesome. That's a thumbs up. Just, sorry, he grabbed the iPad, so now I have to go back. There we go, perfect. I couldn't see my own screen there for a second, but there we go. So these guys are named after their, as you can see, ring tail with the black stripes. So their tail is not like monkeys. So monkeys have what we call a prehensile tail. Um, theirs is not prehensile. So that just means that they can't use it to basically grab onto branches and help them climb through the trees. That doesn't mean though that their tail doesn't come with many other uses. So three main things they use it for. The first one is balance whenever they're running through the trees. The second one is to mark their territory. So they'll rub their tail against their own body. And then as they're going to the trees, they rub it on the trees and that is their way of marking their scent. And the last reason is because lemurs travel in packs of about a hundred lemurs. And of course they need to tra keep track of all their friends. So they just stick their tail straight up in the air and that way helps them to distinguish their friends from the environment around them. Now, like I said, we have Queen Elizabeth and King Julian in here. If you've seen the movie Madagascar, you might remember they said King Julian was the king of all lemurs. Now, this is actually not true because in the wild, it is a female dominant hierarchy. So it's the females who are the leaders of the packs. They're the ones who make all the decisions. They're the bosses. They also decide who gets to eat first. Of course, if you're gonna decide who gets to eat first, you're probably gonna choose yourself. So whenever we feed these guys, we have a few feeding platforms. And that's just to make sure that uh, while our female is feeding, our male can also get some food too. So I'll just show you what they eat. Some leftovers of their breakfast over here. Mostly fruit. We also give them uh, some like collards, some greens. Um, but yeah, bananas, kiwis, a little bit of pepper, strawberries, sweet potato. They love their fruit. Now, the unfortunate thing about these guys is that scientists predict in about 20 years, 95% of lemurs will be extinct. And that's because they are only found on Madagascar. So if their numbers go down there, that's really the only place that we can find their populations other than of course, in captivity like this. The reason why they're going extinct is the main reason is hunting. So they are being hunted for, their, for food. And then the other thing is the exotic pet trade. So a lot of people are illegally um, capturing these animals in the wild and then using them to sell in the exotic pet trade. So our two lemurs had babies close to two years ago. The babies are at our other facility just because we want more people to be able to learn about lemurs, raise more awareness about them. And hopefully, you know, with lots of people raising awareness about these wonderful little guys, their numbers will rise again in the future. All right, if you don't have any questions, I'll just continue to our next habitat. Oh, I have a yes. quick question actually, and I'm not sure maybe folks on, on the call are, are wondering too, um, mm -hmm. but do you have any tips or any you know, organizations that are working towards conservation um, of lemur populations, any okay. way that uh, they can participate if they feel compelled to, to help it out? Right, that's a great question. Um, my advice to you would definitely be to do your research. Um, Google is probably your best friend for that. Um, as for like specific organizations, I'm not sure of any specific ones that are specifically targeted towards lemurs. There are a lot that are uh, trying to, so Madagascar is known as like the most biodiverse island on the, in the world. So there are a lot of organizations that are trying to keep it that way. Trying, like, of course, it's really great to be able to go to Madagascar and see it for yourself. But of course, tourism can affect biodiversity. So there are a lot of organizations um, 
that are about responsible tourism. So when you go there, like how can you be a responsible tourist? How can you travel while still respecting the environment that you're in? Awesome, thank you. Of course. Okay, I'll just continue. It's gonna get oh, wait, dark. I just, like, sorry to interrupt one more time. I see another question in the chat. Oh, awesome. Is there fur soft? <laughs> sorry? Is there fur soft? Oh yes, it's really, really soft. Here, I'll give you a little close up. Awesome. As you can see, hi, buddy. So yeah, really soft fur. Very, very soft. Definitely a lot softer than a dog's. Probably some of the softest fur that I've felt. So yeah, these guys are really cool. They're very curious too. They love shoes. <laughs> Wait, did you just All say right. shoes? Like they like to Yeah, they love shoes. shoes. Like here, I'll just see if I can. Uh, if I put my foot next to him, you usually will take interest in the shoe. <laughs> Not today. But usually he likes to check out everyone's shoes. If you come in here, the first thing they want to look at is your shoes. Oh, that's too funny. Two connoisseurs. <laughs> All right, I'm going to head out. It's going to be dark for a second, and that's because we have, like, a double door system here. And that's just because, uh, of course, we don't want any leaders running around the entire building. That would be quite an interesting chase. So yeah, definitely when you're working with animals, one of the most important things to remember is to lock the door behind you. There we go. Okay, so we just went to Madagascar. I am now gonna head over to South America. So Any of you have a guess, maybe you can think what animals are from South America? That I might be seeing. I will say this animal is one of the few ones in the facility. I don't have to worry about too much about closing the door behind me because they aren't fast. They're very slow animals. You might have a guess, especially if you've seen the movie Zootopia. It's going to show you. There they are. So we have two sloths in here. Like I said, one of the only exhibits I don't have to worry about the door being open. The main worry is letting heat out more than letting these guys out because. Uh, they're definitely not winning any races. So their name in French actually directly their, translates to lazy. Their name in French is Parasseur, for any, any French speakers out there. And uh, these guys are really cool because a lot of people go down to South America, especially Costa Rica, and they book these tour packages where they're promised to see um, some sloths. Now, if you go to Costa Rica and you see a sloth, count yourself very lucky. These guys are extremely hard to find in the wild. And that's because they move so slowly that they actually have moss, algae, and oh little plants grow all over them. And then they live really high up in the trees and they don't move much. So you look up, you can't look for movement because they're very slow movers. And then they camouflage really nicely. So very hard to find in the wild. Now their names in here are Lilo and Roger. Lilo is this one right here. She kind of looks like she combs her hair every day. Roger's a more scruffy looking one. Now sloths, they're really fun animals, but uh, personally I find sloth facts more interesting. Well, sloths are interesting, but as you can see, they don't do a whole lot. So they eat, and they sleep and they go to the bathroom once every one to three weeks. So even that they don't do very much. And when they go to the bathroom, they have to come down from the trees. And that is one of the only reasons that they ever come down from the trees is to go to the bathroom. And that is the time at which they're most vulnerable. So they're hunted by large cats in South America. And so when they come down, like I said, they're not fast movers. So that is the most dangerous time for them. But when they are up in the trees, they are pretty much unbothered. In the wild, they can live about 20 years and in captivity up to 40. And that's just because of course, in captivity, don't have to worry about predators and a lot less stress. Don't have to worry about looking for food every day because everything is provided for you. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna move on from these guys. They're not too active for us today, but I'd have to say that's how they are most of the time, unless I had food. If I had food, they'd be a little bit more interested. 
<laughs> Jasmine, I have one question in the audience here yes, um, in the chat. So Michael has asked, how long do sloths live for? I guess in captivity and then maybe in the wild. Right. So captivity, um, sorry, in the wild, about 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then in captivity, up to 40. Oh, wow. How old yes. are these guys? Do you know? Yes. So right here, this one, that's Lilo. She's about three years old. And then up there, we have Roger. He's about four. Aww. Now, we actually have uh, three sloths at our facility. There are other sloths in another habitat. The reason why they're not all together is because we have two male sloths and one female. And if we put the other male in here, he would fight our the Roger here for mm. dominance. Um, it would be a very slow fight, though. Nothing <laughs> that you need to grab popcorn for. Nothing too exciting. <laughs> oh, too funny. Thanks, Jasmine. Of course. All right, I will just head over to our next habitat now. All right, over here. I'm going to show you quite a large animal and I'm going to ask you a question. What do you guys think? Is this a crocodile or an alligator? Maybe you can just answer in the chat or answer in your heads there. So lots of people might know you look at the mouth shape. So if it's a longer, more narrow V-shaped mouth, then it's a crocodile. And if it's a shorter, more U-shaped mouth, then it's an alligator. And I find that alligators, their teeth tend to poke out a little bit more as well. So have your answers ready. I'll give you the answer now. This is a crocodile. It's a Nile crocodile. So congrats to anybody who got that right. <laughs> as you can see, the mouth is quite narrow, quite long. I can show you an alligator later just for comparison. His name is Nigel. And like I said, he's a Nile crocodile. So he's from Africa. And he's also the second largest species of crocodilian. So the largest species is the saltwater crocodile. And the record for them was they found a 23 feet long saltwater crocodile. So Nigel here is about eight feet long. So just imagine a crocodile three times the length of this guy. So quite massive. Now, these guys are cold-blooded animals, and a common misconception is that cold-blooded animals have cold blood. Now, that is not true. So humans, we're thermoregulators, which means that we have quite a range of temperatures that we can live in, and we can thermoregulate. So when we're cold, we shiver. When we're hot, we sweat. Cold-blooded animals don't have the same capacity to do that. So they really rely on their environment to regulate their temperature. So when they're too hot, they will go in the water or seek up shade. And when they're too cold, they'll go find light like these heat lamps or in the wild, that would be the sun. So we do the same thing. However, like us humans, we can live in really cold temperatures and we can live in really hot temperatures. Whereas cold blooded animals are really specific to certain areas because they rely on the environment for thermoregulation. A lot of people ask me. Oh, sorry, sorry, Jasmine. I just have a question. Of course. Is there a certain location in the world that crocodiles live in versus alligators, or do they just like live together in the same spaces? Right. So the thing with a lot of uh, animals that fall in the same family, they don't tend to overlap too much. And that's okay. like if you, for example, if you think of bears, polar bears live in the north. Then we have a little bit of overlap with grizzly bears and black bears. The reason why um, there's very little overlap is because of like uh, whenever they predate, they would fight each other for dominance over the area. Okay. So there might be small overlap of crocodiles and alligators, but they tend to each have their own regions. Now they are found all over the world though. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Now with the, I might remember I was mentioning the mouse shape just held them apart that's most distinct in the American species of crocodiles and alligators. So when you look at an American crocodile, American alligator, 
the mouth shape is very distinct from an, one another. In other parts of the world, it's harder to tell them apart. All right, if there's no more questions, I'll just move on. Sorry, Jasmine, just one more of thing. Course. What's this guy's name or girl? His name is Nigel. Nigel, okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> of course. All right. I'm heading over to my next habitat now. I think uh, a lot of people are scared of this animal. I think I heard that Sam was a little bit nervous about these guys. I promise they won't jump to the screen. You're perfectly safe over there, but I'm just gonna show you in the water here. Oh, there we go. So in here we have a reticulated python. We actually have two. So one is here and the other guy is kind of see his tail poking out over there. These guys are our largest snakes at the facility. Now, reticulated pythons are the longest species of snake. So the record for them, they found a reticulated python, which was 32 feet, nine inches. And just to help you guys visualize how long that is, imagine a yellow school bus. It was the same length of a yellow school bus. Luckily, not the same size. That'd be pretty terrifying, but the same length. <laughs> so a lot of people ask if the snakes are good swimmers, because as you can see, he's in the water right now. So there are some snakes that are semi-aquatic. These guys here are not. Anacondas, on the other hand, are. Just because they're not aquatic, though, doesn't mean that they don't like to go in the water. So like I said, these guys are um, cold-blooded. So if he's feeling a little too warm, he'll go in the water to cool off and they can hold their breath for quite considerable amounts of time. And pythons are constrictors. Lots of uh, snakes are constrictors. The other way they hunt their prey is venomous. So like, for example, rattlesnakes are venomous and their venom actually also helps them digest their food. So a lot of people, if they want to own a venomous snake, they will remove their venom glands and then we will call it a, venom a venomoid. The issue with that is that um, venomous snakes do need that venom to help them digest their food. So always a good thing to remember, always do your research before you decide to take on the res responsibility of having any animal as a pet. It looks like we've got a question from Michael in the chat. Jasmine, so I'll just read that out to you. Okay. So he's asking, you know, do you keep the climate constant in their rooms? How would they handle a sudden change if they spent their whole lives in captivity versus another animal that may be used to more frequent changes? Right, that's a great question. So like I said, cold-blooded animals, they really rely on their environment for thermal regulation. So whenever we set up a habitat, we had to be really aware of how we set it up. So I'll show you. Over here, we have the heat lamps, so they can go under there. But to any area that you have a heat lamp, we also want an area where they can be in the shade. So as you can see, we have that little tunnel there. So that's what that way, if they wanna be out of the water, but they still don't wanna be in the light, they can go in that tunnel. And then we also have the water for them so that they can cool off. So all of our snakes have a little water bath. So snakes know when they're too hot, let's go in the water. When they're too cold, let's go hang out in the sun. So just like how they would do in the wild. Um, one really important thing in animal care is to observe um, every snake, every iguana, every lizard, every animal that we have, they all have personalities. Some snakes prefer a little bit more warmer temperatures, just like us humans. Some of us tend to be on the colder side. Some of us tend to always be on the warmer side. So if I go into a habitat and that snake is always under the heat lamp, but today it's not, it's not the end of the world but it's a good thing to take note of because it's just an odd behavior. So then I would check the, the uh, temperature in the habitat and I would notice, oh, hey, it's a little bit warm in there today. That's why he's not under the heat lamps. It's already pretty hot in there. And then if it's a little cold, then, oh, that's why he's under the heat lamps today. So always good to just keep monitoring all your snakes and know each individual one, what their behavior is usually like. All right, if there's no more questions, I'll continue. Okay, so over here, gonna see, yep, they're out for us. 
just as a size comparison, and here, you can kind of see him crawling up, we have a hognose snake. I see if I can give you a better view there. So a lot smaller. These guys I really like because uh, they're kind of funny. Whenever they're scared, they actually play dead. So what they do is roll over on their back, they stick out their tongue, and then they let out pheromones, which make it, makes it smell like they're decaying. And that's just so they look as least attractive as possible to anything that might want to eat them. Which is why I also always tell people, even if you think a snake is dead, never a good idea to pick it up because it might not be. They're not the only species of snake who will do that. So these guys here, they'd probably get like small mice and stuff to eat. Whereas our large uh, reticulated pythons over there, they're about 16 feet long and they will get goats, 75 pound goats they can eat. All right, I'm going to head upstairs now to our outreach area. It's always fun doing Zoom calls because this area, if you come in for a tour, it's not accessible to the public, but of course, if I'm doing a Zoom tour, I can go all over the building. So special access for Zoom tours. Now I'm gonna ask, anybody have a fear of spiders? I know it's a very common fear. I promise you though, this guy will not jump to the camera towards you guys. So I will just open him up and turn around the camera for you. And there we go. So this is a tarantula. The golden knee tarantula named after those yellow kind of golden colored stripes on their knees. Now, lots of people are scared of spiders, especially tarantulas. And that's because of a common myth. And that's that tarantulas can kill humans. That is not true whatsoever. There has never been even one reported case of a tarantula killing a person. So tarantulas only have enough venom to kill what they eat. Of course, us humans were way too big kind of put my hand there for size comparison. There we go. So a little bit smaller than my hand. So these guys would hunt mice and insects. And if they did bite me, it would hurt like a bee sting. So nothing too bad. And tarantulas use their venom mostly for hunting, not for defending. If he did want to defend himself, what he would do is use his back legs to kick off the hairs on his rear end there, and they flick those towards any predators. And they're just very irritating, so itchy, not so pleasant, just gives, um, gives enough of a distraction towards the predator for them to get away. Another cool thing about tarantulas is that they hunt differently than house spiders. So house spiders will lay cobwebs in corners, and then wait for insects to get caught in the cobwebs. These guys are a bit different. What they do is they will go inside the tunnel there and then they will lay cobwebs on the ground but just outside the tunnel. Then they wait for an insect to crawl across or a mouse to crawl across the cobwebs and those send vibrations to the tarantula waiting inside. And then it's like ringing the dinner bell. They know that uh, dinner is waiting outside and they'll come out and strike their prey and then they'll have their meal. So pretty cool little guys. Now another thing to know is that actually all spiders are venomous. So even the little tiny house spiders that we have, they're also venomous. Of course they do not have enough venom, venom to do us any harm and their fangs are actually too small to even penetrate our skin. Jasmine, I have a question for you. Does this spider, does it still have um, like a stinger and venom? Yep, so he's fully venomous and they have, like if I get close there, you can see the hairs on his rear end. Oh, wow. It's a good way to tell um, and how easily agitated a spider is. I never say that, call them aggressive. So we don't like to use that word because it sounds like they're attacking unprovoked. But of course, that's not the case. They're just defending themselves because they feel scared or they're attacking because they're hungry. 
So not aggressive, either food driven or defensive. So to tell how easily agitated a spider is, which means how easily it might get scared, if you can look at the hairs on its butt. So if there's lots of hairs left, then we know that this spider is pretty calm. He doesn't get scared too easily because he doesn't flick his hairs too often. So as you can see, this spider has lots of hairs on his butt, so I'm not too worried. But uh, if he's having lots of hairs missing, then we know that he's probably been pretty scared recently and might be a bit agitated at the moment. Very cool. All right, I'll just put him away. And uh, you guys can ask me any questions that you might have. Awesome. I see that we have some kiddos on this call. Did you kids have any questions about the spider? You seem pretty, I'll, I'll unmute you. Do you guys have any questions? <laughs> You'll just have to, I requested to unmute. There you go. Uh, what, what, how, uh, how big do they grow? Sorry, one second. I'm just gonna unplug our fans so I can hear you better. Sure, that's a really great question. Do they want that? She's gonna answer in just a second. She's just near a fan right now, so she's finding it hard to hear. Sorry about that. There's a fan on, so I couldn't hear too well. What was your question? How 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 big do, do the how big do they grow? The tarantulas? So the size yeah. you saw there is pretty much full grown. Now the largest species of uh, spider in the world is found in Australia, of course, and uh, it's about the size of a dinner plate. Like a big, like one of those big dinner plates? A big dinner plate, yes. And they can actually like hunt birds. Like this? Like this? Like that. <laughs> Oh yeah, my. so if you're really curious, you can always uh, do a YouTube yeah. video. We don't have any of them here, unfortunately, but uh, they're pretty impressive. That, that's huge. It is huge, I know, and they hunt birds. They hunt birds. What? Did you hear that part? Yeah. Wait, and, what, and how, wait. How old, how long do they live? How long do they live? That's a great question. So it really depends on the species of spider. So like the spiders that we find in our house might live a couple of weeks, whereas um, like tarantulas and stuff, they can live months or longer. Awesome. Well, I think we'll move on to our next animal, but I All will, right. if you guys have any more questions, I can unmute you again and you can ask those questions. Does that sound good? All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. So our next animal, also a common favorite. I'm just gonna open up a little door here so we can get a good view. Turn around the camera. So there he is. Any guesses as to what that is? So this is a chameleon. And I always love showing these guys because there's a very common myth about these guys. And that's that chameleons change color to camouflage. I'm sure you've heard of that before. It's not true. They do not change color to camouflage. Big myth. The reason why they change color is for communication. So as you can see, this is like their resting color. It's green and brown. And where do they live? They live in the trees. What color are trees? Green and brown. So they really don't need to change color for camouflage. They already camouflage very nicely. So chameleons can't talk. And I don't just mean speak English. I mean, they can't communicate with each other using sounds. So what, how they communicate is by changing color. So if this guy here was defending his territory and he saw another chameleon, what he would do is he would change to a really bright color as fast as he can. And then if the other chameleon changes to a bright color faster than him, then he wins the fight. And then if this guy sees a pretty girl and he wants to see if she's interested, then he'll change to a nice bright color. And if she changes to the same color, then that's her way of saying, hey, I'm interested in you too. But if she changes to a very different color like black, then that's her way of saying, no, 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 please leave me alone. So that's why they change color, just for communication, not for camouflage. Jasmine, mm -hmm. they actually 
I actually saw a TikTok last night and it was about a chameleon that was, he had changed his color to, I think it was yellow. Okay. And his owner was saying that he changed his color because he was upset that there was like a yellow leaf in his enclosure and that chameleons don't okay. like the color yellow. So when they're upset, they'll like change their color and they'll stay like that right. until that color yellow is removed from their cage. Is that true? So um, it is true that they will change colors like based off emotion because that's how they communicate. Yeah. Um, whether there's a yellow leaf in their enclosure would upset them. Um, I guess that would really depend on the chameleon. Um, maybe okay. he thought the leaf was misinterpreted it for another chameleon or for something scary. Um, I don't think a yellow, like if it was just a leaf would scare him, but he could have thought okay. it was something. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Now, another cool thing that these guys do, and scientists aren't 100% sure why they do it, is that when they walk, they actually waddle back like to side to side. And um, we're not 100% sure why they do this, but at the moment, the theory is also for camouflage. So just like how leaves will kind of move in the wind with the movement, these guys will also waddle back and forth to kind of mimic the movement of leaves in the wind. So it's pretty cool to watch. Another cool thing about chameleons, if I can get a nice close up here for you guys, see their eyes. You can see how do full rotation, look right behind him. Their eyes can actually move completely independent from one another. So this eye can be looking behind him and the other eye can be looking completely in front. And that's a great way for them to survey their entire area, see if there's anything that might be hunting them. Now, if they are hunting something else, like little insects that they might be going after, they'll have to use both eyes looking forward for depth perception. So they can use both eyes to look in different directions, but then they don't have any depth perception when they do that. All right, there's no questions about that guy. I will move on, but feel free to ask any while I close him up here. Could we ask a quick question? Of course. Um, what is the little sort of fin that he's got on the top of his head? Does he use that for anything specific? Right, so that would also help with, um, I'll just give you a good look so you can see it. She's talking about right there. That would also, for two reasons. First of all, it would probably make them look more intimidating towards other chameleons. Um, lots of uh, lizards and iguanas, we observe them, they have these big beards, they have like these kind of like that, you can see on their, oh, don't wanna bother him, but you can see on their tail, they kind of have, or on their back, they have that little fin that sticks up. So that's just always to make them look bigger, bigger, more intimidating. Um, of course, the bigger they look and the more intimidating they are, the more likely they are to win territory and have other chameleons and other animals in the environment, leave them alone. Thank you. Of course. All right, I am going to head over here. Want to get a nice good close up of a snake for you guys. See, we have lots of snakes up here, but I'm going to see if I can find one that's uh, not in its hide. Uh, actually, I'll show you guys what we do to take out a snake. So I'll turn my camera around so you can see what I'm holding. I have this metal rod. Looks scary, but it's not. It's not even pointy. So what we use it for is just to pick up a snake. Um, we can pick it up with our hands, but uh, this is a great way to basically break what we call a food drive or food response. So whenever, right here I have a ball python. Whenever we go into an enclosure, it doesn't matter what kind of animal you're working with. Oops, sorry, they'll most likely have something we call a feeding response. And that just means, especially with uh, reptiles, they sense movement, they might smell some food and then they strike, right? Because they sense movement, they smell food. Of course, I don't want to be bitten. It's kind of inevitable whenever you're working with animals, it's going to happen eventually, but there's ways to prevent it. You can wear gloves. Um, of course, you always want to observe the animal. So when I come up to the, the enclosure, he might move his head towards me. He's sensing my movement. He's doing those little tongue flicks. So the tongue flicks are how they uh, 
smell basically and sense the area around them, taste if there's any food around. So I just watch for those kind of signs and then I would open it up just like so. See how he's kind of moving his head. So that could be a food response. Also just, you know, him being aware of the environment around him, just like that. And then I would grab that metal, this thing. And then I would just gently tap him on the head. So I'm not actually gonna take him out. I'm just gonna give you guys a nice view of him, but I would tap him on the head, just like that. Get close very gently. And that basically breaks their food response. Basically tells him, no, I'm not food. Um, and then they're usually pretty easy after that. And you can also like hold it between you. So that way, if they do have a food response, they'll hit this and not hit you, but it's not sharp. So it's not gonna hurt them. And like I said, this is a ball python. So her name is Snuggles. Um, ball pythons are pretty common to have as pets whenever people are first getting a snake. And that is because they're very easily to handle. Ball pythons are one of the easiest snakes to handle. If you want a snake that's just gonna kind of hang out in your lap and chill out most of the day, great snake for that. They're not too, too active. Um, easy to handle, like I said, they are constrictors, so they don't have any venom. Another common uh, snake to start out with is the corn snake. Also great snakes, very easy to handle. They're on the other hand, a lot more active. So if I was holding a ball python, kind of just relax in my hands, not be slithering around too much. Uh, corn snakes are a lot more curious. So like I said, easy to handle, but uh, they do like to slither around, kind of explore, go up on your shoulders and down your legs a lot more. I think someone on the chat here, ha, Bonnie, I think it's you. You have a corn snake? That is awesome. You're so brave. I have a corn snake. Um, I just rescued him. He's two years old. Oh and I have a bearded dragon who's almost five years old. So, Oh my gosh, uh, that's awesome. My, yeah, my snake thinks he's my my corn snake thinks he's my hairdresser. He loves to go up in my hair, yes. <laughs> out my hair, and hang out. And he's actually very cuddly. He likes the warmth of my crook of my arm. He wraps himself around me like a handcuffs and sleeps on me. Right now, I want to take him out, but like she said, he he's hiding, and I don't want to disturb him. Exactly. Him three yeah. weeks. I'm still trying to get him used to the environment. We put our hands, we hold him, but if he's hiding. I'm not going to force him out because it just yeah. does cause stress. Exactly. That's a great point to bring up. So whenever we were watching our animals, like I said, I was looking to see which snake was already out of its hide. Um, you know, if it's in its hide, we don't usually want to disturb it. There might be a reason why it's in there. Um, so snakes do shed. And when they're shedding, they actually can't see as well. So that might be a reason why they're in their hide. They're a little bit more nervous when they're shedding. Um, I'll just show you why they shed. If I can get it as close up of his eye here. There we go. So I don't know if you can see that, but they actually have um, a fused eyelid. So if anybody ever tells you to have a staring contest with a snake, um, they're messing with you because snakes don't blink. So you're never gonna win that staring contest. Uh, they have, like I said, a fused eyelid. So they have a scale over their eye. And when they shed, that scale also gets shed. And so that's why their eyes kind of turn like this milky white color, looks like they have cataracts. And that's just that scale that's shedding. And snakes, on average, when they're young, they'll shed twice a month. And that's because they're growing a lot, need more room for more growth. When they're older, about once a, once a month, five to six times a year. And the reason why snakes shed is because just like our shoes wear out, the, sna the scales on a snake's belly will also wear out over time. So they just shed their skin to kind of renew um, the scales. So that uh, nice new fresh shoes for them. Same idea. I'm gonna put them back in. There we go. And then shedding their skin is also really great for getting rid of any parasites and mites that they might have. And you can, so like I said, we can tell when a snake is about to shed because we look at the eyes and it's what we call the opaque or the blue period. So as you can see, his eyes are pretty clear right now. So it doesn't look like he'll be going to shed anytime within the next few days, at least. And our snakes here, we, we also don't like to take them out just after we fed them because snakes eat um, like everything in one big bite, I guess you could call it. Um, if you ever watch a snake feed, you can kind of see as it moves down. 
And of course, if you go to pick up a snake and just ate a big meal, it can be, they're kind of bloated. It's a bit uncomfortable if you're handling them just after they've eaten. So that's why we kind of like to let them give a few days to digest. And we feed our snakes here about every, once every two weeks. So snakes don't need to eat nearly as often as we do. Um, so this guy, we would probably give him a, a large rat. He's a decent size. Smaller snakes would get a small mouse and our larger snakes can get like chickens, rabbits, or even goats. So it really depends on the size of the snake. And if they do get a larger meal, then they can go longer without eating. The record a snake has ever gone without eating was two years. So going a year without eating isn't really an issue for these guys. We've got a question in the chat for you, Jasmine. Mm -hmm. How long did it live? How long do they live? That's a great question. Really depends on the species. Depends, of course, if they're their environment if that they're in. So if there's a lot of predators around, then uh, they won't live as long. But uh, they can live about 25, 30 years. Like I said, depends on the species. But that's actually a good point to bring up too, because so the main difference between pythons and boas is that pythons lay eggs, boas give live birth. Now, when they do give birth, they have lots of babies. So big clutch size is what we call it. So one of our female Burmese pythons, she had eggs a few months ago and they hatched about a month ago. And um, she laid 42 eggs, 38 of them hatched. That's a lot of babies, but not all of them, first of all, are even gonna hatch. And second of, them, not all of, them, second of all, not all of them are gonna live to maturity. So they have large clutch sizes, but uh, their survival rate isn't as high because of the clutch size is so large. I'm just gonna turn the camera around so uh, you can watch me pick her up and put her back in. Good to see you. She's very curious. Just gonna take her out. Another thing that, because uh, lots of people are scared of snakes, I'll just give you a good, good look at her before I put her in. They're scared of snakes because, or they don't like them because they think they're gross. Um, and that's because people think they're slimy. Now that is not true. Snakes are not slimy. They don't have um, secretory glands like we do. So the reason why people think that they're slimy is because lots of people are nervous when handling snakes. And what do humans do when they're nervous? They sweat. So our hands get sweaty and then we touch a snake and we think it's the snake that is wet and slimy. But it's actually us. So I'm just gonna put her back in now. As soon as she sees her hide, we're usually pretty happy to go right back in. And there we go. Just turn the camera around so you can see. So whenever I put her in, I kind of try to show her her, her hide and she'll be pretty content to head right back inside. Great snake. She's always fun to work with. All right. Did we want to go into a Q&A period or did you want me to show another animal? Did you want to show another animal quickly? Of course, Jasmine? yeah. Then we can wrap it up. All right. Perfect, thank you. Head back downstairs. Can I ask a question? Of course. Do you actually have any bearded dragons there? We do not. Okay. Yeah. Sorry the interesting see, thing about bearded dragons is that, uh, so a lot of the animals we have here are actually animals that have been illegally smuggled into Canada. Bearded dragons were many, many, many years ago illegally smuggled into Canada. Now we have so many of them here. They're all over pet stores that it's kind of like whatever now. Now the issue though is we don't have a lot of bloodlines here in Canada of breeded bearded dragons because new bloodlines are being introduced into Canada. So that is one issue that like we're facing right now. Of course, if you only have one or two bloodlines, lots of inbreeding. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that these bearded dragons don't need a home. I'm sure like you love your bearded dragon. They still need homes. We still need places to put them. But it's always something that you had to be aware of whenever we're 
like doing research about animals, you know, where have they come from. Um, I'm not saying bearded dragons don't make great pets, because they do, I know that they do. Yeah. Mine's the suckiest and spoiled baby. She <laughs> is so spoiled. And she's like, I tell people, she's like a furless cat. She literally, yep. she kills on me all the time. She's very affectionate. She's got a great personality. Yes. I'm so in love with her. It's unbelievable. She's I always- know. I, I don't have one, but I've heard a lot of great things about people who have them as pets. And all we right, were sold a regular one, a regular bearded dragon. But apparently she's a sun, she's a fancy, a sunfire red oh, okay. dragon, which turned out orange and these beautiful colors. Oh, wow. of, uh, so we were very lucky. I that's don't know beautiful. if that's, I don't know where about she's from. Like, yeah, I know she's I, from Austria, yeah. but it's still a beautiful coloring versus that normal beige brown. That's green awesome. Brown. Yeah. Okay, so I'll show you our last animal here. They're actually a type of bird. Maybe you guys can guess. You've seen these birds before. They make for really popular pets because of how beautiful they are. And these are macaws. So the blue and gold one here is Frankie. And the red one in the back is uh, Coco. So like I said, very popular pets because of how beautiful they are. But it's always good to do your research first so that you know what you're getting into, the responsibilities involved with any animal. It doesn't matter if you're getting a cat, a dog, a turtle, a pig, a bird always want to do your research first. And so the thing with these guys is that they have an average lifespan of about 80 years. So they often outlive their owners. So whenever you get one of these, it's a lifelong commitment and possibly past your life. So a lot of owners will try to arrange um, a new home for them because they know that their bird will likely outlive them. The sad thing is that these guys tend to only bond with one person in their lifetime. They can bond with a new person, but it is quite traumatic for them whenever their owner does pass away. So these two here, the reason why they're with us is because they did outlive their previous owner. Luckily, each of them has bonded with uh, one of our keepers. And another good thing to know about these guys, if you want one as a pet, is that they are very, they're extremely intelligent birds. They have the mentality of about a three-year-old, but just like three-year-olds, they love to throw their temporary tantrums when they don't get what they want. So they love attention. They don't get enough attention. They will let you know. Except the difference between these guys and uh, human three-year-olds is that they can scream for 24-hour periods and they're as loud as a jackhammer at a construction site. So beautiful, but also very noisy birds. <laughs> Now, another thing I love about these guys is that they can also talk. So common myth is that they mimic what they hear. That's not actually true. They learn the language. So if I went in there and I didn't say anything, Frankie might say hello to me because Frankie has learned that hello is a greeting. So he's not just saying hello because I've already said hello. He's saying hello because he knows that hello is a greeting in English. So quite amazing how intelligent these birds are. That's super cool, Jasmine. And I, we had one question in the chat um, from mm -hmm. Marisa. She wanted to know, or Marisa, sorry, wanted to know if um, you folks had any marmosets. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hmm. No, I don't believe so. What kind of animal is that? I think it's, uh, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just going to check the chat so I can see. Yeah. Okay, Marmosa. Marisa. Is that like a type of rodent, maybe? I'm not sure. I've actually never heard of them. Me either, but the I'm gonna Google it right now. The parrots are beautiful. All right, no worries. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to ask of course, just in no, case of course. you did have them. <laughs> I'm thinking that they might, I'm taking a wild guess. Uh like I said, I've never heard of them. But uh, if they are a type of rodent, I do have. Um, ferrets here, which uh, oh, cute. Sure many of you guys are familiar with them. I love these guys. So I'll just show you really quick. Probably if I could take any animal home here, it would be these guys. They're super fun. They're just taking a nap right now, but um, they like coming out. So I'll just, there we go. Put them up here so you guys can see. Here he is. Super cute. Hi, buddy. 
So these guys are carnivores. So in the wild, they would uh, hunt rodents, um, like mice and stuff like that. But uh, here they get cat food. And we also give them something called duck soup. There's no actual duck in it. Uh, it's just like a meat puree with some other nutrients that we put in there too, just to make sure they have a really nice balanced diet. <laughs> yeah, very cute. Like I said, probably if I could take any animal home, it would be these guys, they're adorable. And you know, they're known for their really flexible spine. As you can see, it's kind of doing a, a C shape here. The sleeping positions that they have are quite interesting because of that flexible spine. Really great for them though, because they love to run through these tunnels. Now, if they're in a tunnel and there's a 90 degree turn, it's no issue for them. Their spine is so flexible. They can just do that, take that turn, no problem. That's awesome, Jasmine. They are so cute. Yeah. All right, everybody. So before we wrap up today, does anyone have any further questions for Jasmine? I had a quick question about someone who we saw in the background earlier. When you were with the lemurs, I noticed a big cockatoo dancing in one of the windows, and I was oh. wondering what their name was. Yes. <laughs> Those guys love to dance. I'll see if I can show you really quick. But that was probably Pretty Bird. So we have African gray birds in here and also cockatoos. I'll just show you really quick. There's an African gray bird and our cockatoos over there. <laughs> yes, whenever we have people come in for, sorry, the light's kind of reflecting off, but you can see them up there. Whenever we have people come in for in-person tours, especially if there's small children, um, great way to get out of their energy. I tell them to go stand in front of the cockatoos and just start dancing. And those guys <laughs> love to dance. So they'll dance with you. They'll jump up and down. They raise their feathers and they kind of like put their head up and down. Like they're, <laughs> I don't know, move along to some sort of music. We even play the radio for them too. They love yeah. music and they love That's to dance. That's so funny. That's amazing. Yeah. Any other questions? It doesn't look like we have any other questions. So I'll just wrap it up, everyone. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Jasmine. You did wonderful oh, today. That was so much fun. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you to the animals, too, for, for letting us look at you and get some information <laughs> on you. So thank you, everyone, so, so much. Um, I'm just going to share, we're going to share a couple links in the chat now. So the recording, we did record this event. And we have a bunch of different events that we've recorded that you can find on our AC hub on demand website. So we'll share that link in the chat now. Um, we do host a lot of virtual events throughout the month. So feel free to check out our AC on demand website and our calendar for future events. And that's it for now, everyone. I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us and to have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Bye everyone. Thanks for the great questions. Bye Jasmine. Bye.